Hi, this is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard.com, Variety.com, Access.com, Goldmine, and anybody else that wants to buy my work. And if you're interested con- to contact me, uh, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, our weekly discussion of all things Beatles, past, present, and to come. Let me introduce my two co-hosts um, who are on the other side of the country. First, from the state of Connecticut, um, the host of uh, the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And up in the beautiful state of Maine, our musicologist, uh, the man who for years was the master of the Beatle desk at the New York Times and now um, writes for the Wall Street Journal and other publications and is the author of From the Cavern to the Rooftop and got that something how the Beatles I want to hold your hand changed everything. Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello Alan. Hello Steve. Hello Ken. Hello everyone else. Um we have a full show today. Um we have a lot of news. First of all, we're gonna try and run th- through this all very quickly um because there is a lot. At the very top, we first want to talk uh, uh send a message of uh uh, good wishes to Frida Kelly, who um, I wrote this week underwent heart surgery, and she's recovering nicely. Um, Kathy McCabe, one of the producers of Good Old Frida, got in touch with me and let me know about this. And Kat, and Frida posted a a message on the Good Old Frida page. I'm not going to read it, but she um, that's where she announced that she had had. Uh, heart surgery. She also was expressing her wishes to her friends in Mexico City because of the recent earthquake. And she also announced that Billy Hatton of the foremost had passed on. And our condolences also about uh, about Billy. But anyway, uh, so best wishes, Frida, and uh, we hope to uh, uh, see you out there again soon. The next piece of news was the... Um, it finally, uh, after uh, a couple of weeks of anticipation, the Beatles What Goes On demo went on line through the uh, Parlogram website. Actually, it went on eBay, but Parlogram is the auctioneer. And last I heard, somebody told me today that it's the price is like $9,000 already. So it's the price is pretty high up there. But we all got to hear it. And, and just quickly, uh, gentlemen, what would you think of it? Uh, Alan, you first. Uh, well, it's very different from the finished version. I mean, a- apart from the refrain, what goes on in your heart, uh, the the rest of the song is, is completely different. Um, so they obviously gave it a thorough reworking. Um, and I, I, I'd like to hear more of it. I mean, we the bit we've heard is 33 seconds long, and the first few seconds of that are silence. So let's say 30 seconds. Uh, and... Um, yeah, it sounds good. I mean, the the sound quality is is quite good on this thing. So I'm hoping right. that someone will make it available. Ken, hmm. yeah, I would just echo Alan's words there. Um, I noticed that the lyrics and the melody of the the verse that would go into the chorus is noticeably different, and that's what makes it really interesting. The chorus itself sounds like it's similar to what. The finished product was on Rubber Soul. And I do recall, and maybe this this shouldn't be a surprise to our listeners, but if you read Mark Lewison's book, Tune In, he did say that What Goes On was actually one of the earliest Lennon songs. So it could have dated like in the late 50s. So um, there could have been some evolution of that song, and evidently there was from from 1963 when this was done Mm -hmm. to 65. So, uh, yeah, it's very tantalizing hearing something like this and wanting to hear all of it. But it's, it's definitely interesting. I can't wait till I hope that we all get to hear the full version. Right. That's an interesting thought, though, that it evolved from the 50s. I hadn't even considered that, although, I mean, it is early enough. But, hmm, okay. Anyway, um, another thing being auctioned is a George Harrison sitar from 1965. I haven't. I just received the information on this today, although I guess the word had been going around for a couple of days. According to the auction house, um, it was the a sitar dates from 65. There's, there's the year um, that uh, Norwegian wood was recorded, but they do not 
contend that it was the sitar used for Norwegian wood, which is kind of interesting. But um, so, how many sitars do you think he had in 1960? Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> right, right. So th- there's, you know, something else to save up your money for. Um, <laughs> anyway. Another piece of interesting news today was the uh, announcement uh, that eight days a week, uh, the touring years is going to be on PBS November 25th. Or I should say, that's the date that PBS announced it for. Um, but my experience with PBS back in my days when I was doing TV listings is that it can vary depending on where you live and, of course, of course uh, your time zone. So double check your listings when we get close to November 25th to find out exactly when it's airing, if you have not seen it. They're also going to repeat uh, after it, uh, Sgt. Pepper's Musical Revolution, which we talked about here on one of the, on a uh, past show. So may I, what I would really like to see actually is that Sgt. Pepper's Musical Re- Revolution get released. And I wonder if that's going to happen now. Um, may, maybe, hopefully uh, that mm-hmm. would be, that would be kind of nice. Any anybody want to say anything about that? I think if they're going to do it, they should do it now. With the uh, anniversary still, you know, mm-hmm. a big part of this year. You mean right. release it? Yeah, yeah. And I, I would think that most people who listen to the show probably have already seen eight days a week. But seeing it on PBS will give you another chance to look at the Manchester footage and hear the Hollywood <laughs> Bowl footage and say, why on earth did that get an Emmy for best? non-fiction editing. I, okay. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, 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 we know. Is that all you think about with this documentary now? <laughs> Pretty much. There are some good aspects to it. <laughs> Jeez, you dwell Thank on you. one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was going to happen. I knew it. You anyway, do, you uh, do one goat. Yeah. <laughs> A couple of pieces of McCartney news. Um, he, they, uh, It was announced this week that um, there's a new holiday rule, holidays rule, volume two coming out, and it features the version of McCartney, uh, Jimmy Fallon, and the Roots doing "Wonderful Christmas Time," which is, you know, not a new song, but it's the one that was on television. Everybody else on the on the list, on the album, uh, I had not heard of. There is a uh, it, one interesting point. There's. Uh, it says Barnes Courtney featuring Lena Stella. So McCartney and Lennon are on the same album. And is let me, which one is it? Um, oh, and I can't read the. No, I can't read it because my printer separated. But there is a version of Pipes of Peace on there. Right. Which uh, is also interesting. I can't read my glasses. It's by, it's by an artist named Muna or Muna M U N A. Thank you. So that's coming out um, October, October 13th. 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 And finally, for me, according to Syracuse.com, there was a small fire at the McCartney concert at Saturday night at Carrier Dome during Live and Let Die. And there is a YouTube video that shows the fire. It's very tiny. And they got it out very quickly, apparently. But that was... Kind of interesting, anyway. But nobody, and apparently nobody got hurt, so that's a good, good thing to know. Is that the Can first you, time? Is that the first time that that Live and Let Die actually caused a fire? I, this first time I can remember hearing of one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I've never heard of one before, so. I mean, we've seen I, all the documentaries where the pyro inspector, you know, the fire inspector comes in and wants, you know, demonstration of the pyro and checks it all out and all that. So it's <laughs> obviously always a concern. But um, I'm not. I don't think I've ever heard of it actually starting fire before. Right. You know, it's funny that you mention that because at the the last show that I saw, which was at Barclays, the fire was awfully close to um, in the back of the stage to the amps and some of the equipment, and even in the front of the stage, it was near a screen. And I, you know, sometimes the the flames would go up pretty high, and I'm wondering, you know, this is awfully dangerous. It, mm. It's it's probably more dangerous than we realize i mean for all these years they've had it under control but it's kind of surprising that there's never been a mess up mm-hmm. with this I, I, in all I these to, years i seem to recall mccartney wiping soot off of himself a couple of times um but maybe that maybe maybe that's i i, I seem to remember something like that 
but uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, those are those are damn dangerous. You know, he does, they don't fool around <laughs> with yeah. that with that song. Uh, so, wow. Mm-hmm. Ken, you have you have some news to uh, quick news that you're going to give us. Uh, yeah, well, uh, at the end of our news segment here, I just want to bring up briefly the concert that I saw at Barclays. But um, concerning Paul, the second show at Barclays, I don't know if any of you heard about this, but after the concert, he actually showed up at a club, which is owned by the actor Alan Cumming. And this is a gay club, which just uh, you know opened up uh, in the last week or so. And Alan Cumming and the actress Emma Stone were on uh, Broadway recently together for a revival of Cabaret. And they also are in the brand new Billie Jean King biopic called Battle of the Sexes, which opened over the weekend. And after McCartney's concert, he went over to this club and on stage, he joined Alan Cumming and Emma Stone and they sang the Disney song, Part of Your World. On stage. That's Hmm. from uh, The Little Mermaid. And um, there have been photos that have leaked out of of the three of them on stage. And one of Paul and Emma together outdoors. And Paul was wearing uh, a shirt that said, I saw Paul McCartney in Brooklyn. (laughs) Did you get one of those shirts? No, no. If I had my way, I'd buy all the shirts because I love all of them. But it can get kind of pricey. Actually, you know, for this day and age, it's reasonable. It's they're usually about forty dollars for a T-shirt. Really? But, uh, yeah. I mean, was that was that a bootleg shirt or was that a was that, that was a, real? That oh, was, that was a real. That was a real shirt because yeah. I know when I saw him in Fresno. I mean, they had the bootleg shirts inside, but outside they had. I mean, they had the real shirts inside, but outside they had bootleg shirts that were really inexpensive. Yeah, they always um, have them too, and they were not, and they were nice ones too, because I, you know. But uh, yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, Go they ahead. say that that after Paul did this on stage, he also played some tunes on the harmonica. It's <laughs> <laughs> according to a, a report that I read. I don't know what songs they were, and apparently the the uh, the three of them. I guess it's Paul, Emma, and Alan. Alan hit the dance floor. Uh, for some tunes from ABBA and Donna Summer and more. Okay, so um, also, let me see. I love, I, I, let, let me just say, I love that picture of Emma Stone with her head on McCartney. Uh, I thought that was a cute picture. Yeah, anyway. yeah those, those sunglasses on it. It almost kind of looked like the revolver period for Paul. <laughs> oh. I don't know. I guess you guys know about Danny Harrison. Mm-hmm. Danny, there was, uh, of course, the, the concert in Central Park this weekend, the Global Citizens event. And I actually thought originally that Danny Harrison was going to perform there because there was a brief video that appeared online of Danny with Annie Lennox. And underneath it said something about Global Citizen Festival. As it turned out, there was an award ceremony days before the festival. And there was a uh, George Harrison Award. It's the George Harrison Global Citizen Award, which was given to Annie Lennox. And Danny and Annie, (laughs) that sounds funny, Danny and Annie together performed Isn't It a Pity on stage at this uh, award show. And that you can find online. Right. And the the sound quality on that clip is tremendous. It it really is. Mm. Yeah. And also there's a new song that just leaked out today as we're doing this on Monday of uh, Danny Harrison from the new album in parallel and it's called summertime police and Danny's new album comes out October the 6th. Also a few things, a few minor things here for those of you who collect cover versions, there's a brand new album that's just come out from Stephen Stills and Judy Collins together. And in fact, the two of them are touring now they're covering the traveling Wilburys handle with care, which opens their new album. The album's called everybody knows uh, Ringo Starr's Christmas album, I Want to Be Santa Claus, has just come out on vinyl on Mercury Records. You can order that online on Amazon. And Sheila E., who I just saw in concert last night, she has a new album out called Iconic. And what she did was she has covered a lot of uh, politically charged songs from the 60s and 70s because of the... Uh, political climate that we're living in right now, all the craziness going on in the world. And she's covered Come Together, 
on the album, and she's gotten Ringo to play drums on it. And I've heard that version. It certainly sounds like Sheila E. drumming and Ringo accompanying her. I can't be for sure. But I did hear um, Sheila perform it live last night, and it sounded great. And towards the end of the cover, she mixes in a little bit of All You Need Is Love and Revolution into the cover. Oh, so, how cool. There you go with that. What else? Talk well, I had I had a, I had a correction to make. Uh, uh, somebody wrote to us and corrected me about Teresa Saldana, who we talked about last week. With "I Want to Hold Your Hand," she did not get murdered. She did. She died of natural causes. Uh, so, anyway, I wanted to uh, at least make that correction. Um, so, yeah. there we go. So, Ken Ken wants to give us a short review of the. How many shows are we talking here? Two shows or one? Well, it's just the show at Barclays. Cause oh, okay, I, just I, the one show. Yeah. Do you still thought, have another? Sh- do you still have another show to go to? Yeah, tomorrow. Oh my God. <laughs> That's at the NASA Coliseum. In the past week, you're I gonna saw be, Paul. You're going to be eating uh, beans and beans for the next uh, month. <laughs> I don't mind. I'm loving it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so you uh, saw Paul at, at Barclays. Tell us about. Tell us what you thought. Yeah, this was the first show of two at Barclays, and it was like night and day comparing that to what I had said on our last show at Madison Square Garden, because his voice was really in tip-top shape. I'm not going to say it was perfect. He's still struggling on Maybe I'm Amazed. Certain songs, his voice is kind of rough. Certainly four or five seconds is that way. But for the most part, I mean, I was so happy to hear him sing as well, hitting the notes well. Um, His voice when he talked was in good shape. You know, sometimes when Paul speaks, his voice is very hoarse. It wasn't like that at all. He was very pumped during this show. He felt good, and I think that really um, resonated during this show. The band was on fire. I think it was one of the best shows I've seen in the last few years. You know, it's really tough to know when you go to a show from him if you care a lot about the voice, if that's, you know, a big reason why you go. He could sound great one moment, and he could have an off night one night. So it's really tough to gauge. But I was really pleased. I, I, when you see a show like this, there's so many emotions that go through you for a few hours. And certainly seeing the crowd reaction to the songs, singing along to certain songs all together at the same time. You know, it's like everybody's together on this. We all feel the same love for this man. And one of the most emotional things that I, that I went through at this concert, I'll just say this one thing, is that Paul... At one point in the show, he talks about how he tries to avoid reading the signs in the audience because he wants to stay focused on the songs as he's performing them. So he read some of them before going into the next song. And one of them actually read, made it through two hurricanes to be here. Wow. So, you know, when you hear something like that, you can only imagine what that person went through with the hurricanes, but how important Paul McCartney is to this person that they would, you know, even think about anything other than their own personal trauma to go to something like this. And I'm sure it was a big relief to go to the show. But, you know, he still puts on the most amazing show for three hours. And the mere fact that I just mentioned that he went to a club after the show, after he's been on stage for three hours, you'd think he'd be a little bit tired? (laughs) No. I mean, I don't know how he gets all the energy that that he has. But uh, he really is a wonder when you think about it. And, uh, you know, he gives you so much for those three hours. Definitely one, one of the, you know, it's one of the best shows I've seen in the last few years of him. Okay. Are, uh, are, we, uh, are we done with the... Um... Yep. We are. We are. Our, our news segment is over and we are, we are done. Now we are talking about the main part of the show. And what we are going to talk about this week is the Beatles' legacy. We're actually going to do this in two parts. Uh, we're going to talk about the Beatles' legacy, both uh, solo and group, and we're going to talk about whether the releases the Beatles have released, both solo and group, have been good for their legacy, have have done a good job to preserve their legacy. And we're going to start with, obviously, solo, and I think what I'll do is I'm going to start with John Lennon. Okay, mm-hmm. gentlemen? And of, I guess of all the four Beatles, I mean, it's been, it's long been said, and I 
felt this way, that Yoko Ono has done a great job in preserving John's legacy. She hasn't put out much recently new. I mean, most of the stuff, uh, I think the, the most recent stuff, according to my, my list here, you know, t- 2010, she put out the signature box, Give mm-hmm. Me Some Truth, and, and you know, all, and the compilations for the um, uh, 70th anniversary, our 70th birthday. But over the years, she has done, I think, a tremendous job, the best job, probably the best job of all four Beatles. And I don't know, maybe maybe I should have started with somebody else. But, I mean, comprehend, you know, she has been tremendous in terms of what she has done. I mean, if you want to talk about, if you want to include Live in New York City in that, um, I think you should. She's put out a lot of compilations. She's put out a lot of unreleased stuff. She also allowed for the Lost London tapes, which I, I don't think we can ever stop thanking her for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's and there's been the the bundles of of Lennon movies, both good and bad. Uh, you can, I mean, we talked about we briefly mentioned Nowhere Boy last week, but there's been a lot of uh, Beatle movies, uh, uh, Lennon movies, uh, U.S. versus John Lennon. There's been um, Imagine John Lennon, which was another one, um, plus the TV movies. I mean, there's been there's been so many, and I think that as far as Lennon goes, uh, you know, the fact that he was the first one to leave us, she's done a great job with preserving his his legacy. If I was to criticize, and I'm, I, you know, we have not seen a lot of archival releases in the past few years. Um, I think we're overdue for that now. Um, it'd be nice if, if we got uh, maybe some unreleased stuff. Um, but uh, she has done a really good job, you know, as far as giving opening up the vaults. Um, I'm going to start with Ken. Ken, go for, go for it. Okay, I would definitely agree with what you just said there, Steve, about Yoko doing a fantastic job. I don't think you could ask for more than what she has done already. I like to break things down as far as preserving the legacy of an artist in, in uh, different categories. And I'll just run them down real briefly. Go ahead. Re- releasing greatest hits and best of compilations is one thing. The reissuing of the catalog and the remastering of the catalog is another. Promoting their solo work, what they have done themselves, the Beatles, in interviews in particular. Um, also, their live performances, placing their songs in other areas like films or commercials, keeping their name in the public eye, and also tribute concerts that have been held in their honor, certainly in the case of John and George here. So where Yoko's concerned, the compilations and greatest hits albums, I think, have been as good as you can expect. Shave Fish, the John Lennon collection, I Always Love Working Class Heroes, which was a really great two-CD collection, which not only had the hits of John, but a lot of... uh, his great album cuts and Lennon legend. I think they're all fine compilations. You know, you're covering all the singles there that you need. So as far as that's concerned, I think it's very important, as I've said in, in earlier shows that every 10 years or so, you should release some kind of compilation and update things for, you know, the world today and how they should look at this artist as far as looking back at their important works. Um, as far as the catalog, I love the remastering job that's been done on John Solo catalog. I think it's been fantastic. The box set that came out in 2010, the signature box set was great. I loved all the remixed CDs that came out in the 2000s. I love the anthology uh, box set, too, which came out in 1998. As far as promoting the solo work from interviews, most solo Beatle interviews have been them talking about their new album, plus the Beatles, but not overviews of their solo career. But John did that with a few of his interviews, like Playboy, the BBC. He's done some decent interviews for their time. So it's very important for the artist himself to talk about that music instead of just talking about the new album as it comes out. Um, Also, as far as live performances, very difficult to grade on this because there never was a tour from John. We were robbed of two tours, there was a, t- a tour in place, at least according to Gary Van Syok, with Elephant's Memory. And that was derailed because of 
you know, the deportation, you know, all the stuff that John was going going through with the Nixon administration, mm-hmm. being harassed by them, and also from getting murdered in 1980. We could have had a tour to promote Double Fantasy at the time, so we don't know what songs John would have done, although the one-to-one tour was really a precursor for what was to happen on the tour with Elephant's Memory. You got to figure with um, the Double Fantasy tour, there'll be music from that and probably from Milk and Honey. And how much of his tour then would have been mainly solo music? How much would have been Beatles? We don't know. But I do happen to personally feel it probably would have focused more on his solo work. That's just my own gut feeling based on what I think about John, where his head was at at the time. The well, that's what, on, that's, that's what he did. That's what he did in the in the few concerts he did. So, yeah, I, I think you'd almost have to you'd almost have to think that. Yeah. So he would have really promoted his solo catalog at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, films on John's life were all good that Yoko either approved or had some say in. Imagine John Lennon, the U.S. versus John Lennon. The ones you mentioned, Steve, Lennon NYC, Give Me Some Truth. Plus, there were also um, uh, the making of the Plastic Ono Band DVD, which I thought was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then the Live Piece in Toronto concert as well. The only thing that really has to get done, as far as I'm concerned, is that you have to have an upgrade of the one-to-one concert or concerts. That for audio and video. I mean, I certainly would love to see all the material of the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series come out, mm-hmm. although does that do something to preserve the legacy, or does that just really appeal to the hardcore fan that wants everything? And you could apply this to every artist, and we've certainly applied it towards the Beatles as a group. I really have to give Yoko an A for all of her efforts. You know, She's done as much as she could possibly do, I think. The video collection of Lennon Legend, I love that. I love the fact that that came out. And the tribute concerts to John. There was the one in Liverpool in 1990. There was the one that Kevin Spacey uh, hosted at Radio City Music Hall. Those are all very important when you have classic artists, veteran artists, as well as the new artists of today honoring John by covering his music. So I think that helps the legacy continue. There's also the Theater Within annual thing that they just just announced uh, Mm -hmm. uh, for this year um, that Yoko actually endorses. So um, okay. that's another one that should be mentioned. So, But I definitely think of the four Beatles, John's solo catalog has – his legacy has been preserved the best. So that's okay. my feelings about that. Okay. Alan? Uh, yeah, I mean I, I, I want to say I hate to disagree, but actually I hate to agree because it's not very dramatic if we all agree on the same thing. But um, – <laughs> <laughs> but but I have said this for quite some time that Yoko has done a really good job with with John's legacy. I I, I look at it a little differently. I mean I mean I, I understand what Ken is saying about tribute shows. Um, that kind of thing sort of barely intrudes upon my consciousness. But now that you've mentioned it, yeah, that definitely is to do with an artist's legacy, making sure that. Um, that the songs he wrote are in the hands of new interpreters who will um, keep them before the public. Um, That's absolutely Mm. true. I think more in terms of, you know, his legacy as in his own creative work. And she has done a spectacular job of, of that, I think. I mean, not that there aren't other things she can do, and, and I hope she does. But, uh, for instance, the Lost Lennon tapes, um, you know, that was 219 hours of material from her archives, which she just turned over to Westwood One. Now, partly, I think there may have been a quid pro quo there. Westwood One would catalog it um, in exchange for getting to use it. And I think she felt that by having Elliot Mintz um, as the host of that, that he would sort of look after their interests and only play the stuff that they would have both uh, not minded being played. And, and, and maybe to a large degree that's true, but I think he played a lot more than she knew he played. Uh, and I say that because um, in an interview I did with her once, she mentioned that you know, a lot of the stuff that was, I, I, I think she was, um, it was when she was doing a stage musical about 
Lenin, which was an interesting thing. I can't remember the name of it. Um, wrote a piece about it for the Times, but it was so long ago. Uh, it was it was one where many people of different races and genders played John. You know, it was kind of an interesting concept, and and that was you know deliberate. She had a point there that you know John was for everybody. You know, so. I talked to her at that point about uh, she was going to include a couple of songs that she felt were completely unknown, and I mentioned that they were in the Lost Lennon tapes, and she said, yeah, but, you know, in the Lost Lennon tapes, it was just, you know, Elliot would talk over the beginning and end and, and a bit in the middle, and so you really got to hear a bit of the song, but not much. And that's not actually what happened in the Lost Lennon tapes. We got <laughs> to hear... <laughs> We got to hear those tapes pretty much full, you know, um, mm-hmm. and in fact, um, you know, bootleggers assiduously put together, what was it, a, a 12, no, I think it was like a 20 disc series of right. stuff, just the music, cutting out Elliot and just giving us the music. And uh, so that was a whole lot of material. Now, I think that that stuff is not just for the hardcore people. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe it is. But when we're talking about an artist's legacy, what we're talking about is preserving the way the artist worked and preserving how the artist worked and what the artist did. And in John's case, this huge legacy of working tapes from home tells us a tremendous amount about Hmm. what went into his music before we got the record. I mean, the finished records, there's not that many of them, you know, Um, Mm post-Beatles. And that is a huge trove. And there is, I believe, you know, people who've compiled it from Lost Lennon tapes and from other sources that have leaked out and from things she's put out subsequently have made, you know, uh, I think a, a, a 12 CD set um, of all of the archival material that's been out. And that is an awful lot. And you hear the songs taking shape because he would record them over and over with different verses and uh, sometimes on the piano, sometimes on the guitar. And that to me and to anyone who approaches this from the point of view of wanting to know what made an artist tick, that is the primo stuff. And we have an awful lot of it thanks to Yoko. Um, Hmm. Not a lot of it officially released, but you can get it. You know, it's there. It was out. Mm -hmm. Um, On the uh, release stuff, I mean, there was the anthology that she put out that I thought was pretty well done. And, you know, only like five discs or so. It, it, It could go on for many, many more discs. I mean, those things... For those, they had access to EMI studio tapes, which is a whole different body of stuff than um, than the Lost Lennon tapes had, which you know may have had some studio stuff, but it, it largely was his home archive. And if it was studio stuff, it was on a cassette that he took home, so it wasn't quite the quality that you know, they had access to, to put that anthology together. Um, I'd love to hear more of that because what we've heard of Lennon studio outtakes, things get radically different, you know, as a song is being recorded and as things go on. I mean, there are quite a few outtakes of, of God, for instance, and and a lot of the things from the plastic Ono band and, and a lot of things from double fantasy, I'd love to hear much more of that stuff. So I, I, I'd love to see her do that. The films you write, particularly the films that she had a direct input into, like, you know, Imagine John Lennon and uh, U.S. versus John Lennon, whatever it was called, you know, those are things that she had a lot to do with. And I, and I have to say that in a certain way, she's done a lot of this work to preserve John's legacy almost at the expense of her own. I mean, we haven't that's, seen... That's a, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, that's we a haven't really seen a, a deluxe set of Yoko Ono's um, avant-garde art films come out, and those are even were things that John was involved in, you know? I'd, I'd kind of mm. like to see those. Those, again, are available they, on bootleg, but... 
they yeah. finally got around to reissuing her Apple albums. Thank goodness. Mm. Right. I mean that's that's long. I mean that just happened, you know, and that well, was long, did, long overdue. They did that long ago too, though. I mean that was there was there was um, there was the Ryko discs. Yeah, the Ryko discs. Mm. <laughs> right. Um, but, she does actually. She has been involved with some of her films and the films she made with John, showing them at museums. Yeah. But not releasing it commercially. Not releasing them, yeah. Um, and the showing them at museums is an important thing. And uh, but you know, a, a commercial release would be great. Or um, I kind of think you know she has always she's talked about this on and off, and I don't know if it will ever happen. But she's talked in terms of having some kind of John Lennon museum where all the stuff would be available to people who want to come in and listen rather than releasing it. I don't know if that was a pipe dream or if that's in the works or, or whatever, but, um, and in, well, they had that, they had that uh, museum in Japan, mm. but that wasn't really a, a, an audio museum. It was more of a, I think it was more of a memorabilia type museum, but I mean, yeah. still, I mean, you can't do a museum like that without putting a little bit of music in, but they, they did have that. It's no longer, no longer exists, unfortunately. I think she was thinking of a, you know, more of a permanent one in New York city. Um, hmm. But also, however, you know, on the way to that, you know, she has loaned lots of his materials to rock and roll hall of fame and, um, and I think some other places that have done exhibitions, and um, right. So you know, you get to see things like you go to the you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame museum in Cleveland, and you see the Daily Howl right there under mm. a glass case, and you see his um, you know various stage suits and all that. And and there was uh, they they did a show. In New York, it was a, a limited show at the sort of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame annex down in, you know, lower Manhattan. That was, you know, a just John Lennon show. And she put out uh, manuscripts, uh, song manuscripts with annotations in the margins. And, you know, it was great stuff to see, you know, his piano and 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 I got a, a tour of that because I was again writing a piece for the Times, and so I went in there with just her, and we walked around, and and so she told me a lot of stuff, a lot of which I put into the piece or tried to put into the piece. For instance, you know, she would point out that on his piano, you could see sort of burn marks because he always would put his cigarette on the piano when he was working, mm. and it would burn down, and it would burn the piano. So, um, yeah, there's a, a lot of stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see some more commercial releases, but commercial releases aren't everything. And these days, in a way, they're nothing because nobody buys commercial releases. Right. Um, mm. But she's, you know, she's, she's done a really good job of keeping that legacy before the public. So. One, one thing I should mention that's probably on the other side of the coin is the commercials. There's been, mm. I think there's been more Lennon commercials than there, maybe more than there have been Beatle commercials. Um, she's been kind of well known for, you know, how many commercials there have been. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, what do you guys think of the commercials? I'm, you know, I, the one that I, that I, uh, the, the Imagine one I saw recently is actually very nice. Um, but there have been others, I believe, that have not been. Well, the Beatle ones actually have been more com more commercial. I think she's basically done. Uh, the ones I can think of off the top of my head have been actually nice. But mm -hmm. I do remember a few years ago the song "Only People" was in a commercial, but I don't remember what it was really? for. Yeah, really? Yeah, really. Was used. It was the actual recording. John's okay. recording too. <laughs> so usually, I mean, Yoko has done a tremendous job at pushing the song Imagine and making it such an important song worldwide. Right. right. You know, you got to give her credit for that. Sometimes I wish some of his other songs would get that kind of attention, but it's nice to see that, you know, a, a great song like Imagine has. Yes. And you got to give her credit for that. So. Okay. All right. Let's move on to Ringo. Okay. And okay. I, I will. Go ahead. That would be, that'd, that'd that'd be a short discussion. <laughs> that would be uh -huh. a, definitely a short discussion because Ringo really hasn't done all that much. I mean, he's put out a couple of anthologies for um, you know for uh, all-star band work, 
there has been I'm trying to think if there has not been any movies uh, with Ringo. There, I mean, there was the uh, he has tried to do a couple of uh, interesting things. He had a USB release for uh, Liverpool Eight. Yeah. Um, he had a five-one surround sound collection, which actually won a Grammy, as I recall. So th- that was kind of interesting. But Ringo hasn't done really much of anything. I mean, he's talked about putting out a a, uh, a compilation. Uh, the Russians beat him to it. They put out a, a compilation that uh, I believe you can still get on on uh, Amazon for like about fifteen bucks, but uh, which is actually a very good. It looks very nice. But Ringo hasn't done one himself, and it's really uh, you I know. Think uh, he, I think he has. Hold on, he did a a compilation a few years ago. I can't remember what it was called. It had nothing new oh, you on mean, it. No, you, he had photographed the very best of Ringo Starr. Yeah. Okay, and, but and that was that, like that one or two CDs. I'm trying to remember. I don't that's remember. One. Was it one? That's one. I CD. mean, but that's really. I mean. The the Russian thing was two CDs and it was mm-hmm. I don't know how many tracks, but that was a I mean that was a very full compilation and he hasn't done anything that extensive, and as I when we talked about that on the show, I said you know this is really the type of thing he should be doing, you know I mean it it, it had a great collection of his music, it showed you know how how much better his output has been than people give him credit for. And he hasn't really he hasn't really done that. So maybe and not he'll... only that, not only that, but Ringo on average puts out a new album every couple of years. Right. So since Photograph, the very best of Ringo Starr, there's probably four or five albums he's made since then. You really need to update every like I said, every ten years or so and put out a new compilation. Ringo's never had one beyond one C D. He's had Blast from Your Past. He had Starstruck, which is actually kind of interesting because it was all of his music after the Capitol years. Uh, and then he also had Photograph, uh, but he's never had anything really extensive. Certainly nothing like two CDs worth of material. And he certainly, considering the fact, as we've just noted, he just put out his 19th album. <laughs> Photograph, uh, by the way, was 2007. Okay, so that's 10 years ago already. Mm-hmm. So... Um, yeah, he certainly warrants a good two CD collection right there. I mean, he's put um, out a lot of live albums that he has done, mm-hmm. but I think the studio albums are are really more important as far as preserving your legacy, and he hasn't really done that. Not I mean, only so, that, he hasn't ahead. even remastered his albums. They've yeah. all come out on CD, but you don't have uh, a new remastering. The five one, the five one, I believe, was remastered. Okay, um, I think that's the only one um, that you could say was actually rem- no, and there was there was there was one other, and I can't remember what it is now. Um, I believe Photograph was remastered, wasn't it? Wasn't Photograph remastered? I don't remember that. I believe I remember it. Remember hearing that? It I might believe- have been, but, but you know, whether there are compilations or remasters is is kind of really the entry level. You know, if we're talking about about maintaining the the legacy of someone um that's like the least you can do right and Mm -hmm. um you know there haven't been a lot of bonus tracks when there have been it's mainly been you know some singles that were uncollected uh, which you could also get on the compilations there haven't been many studio outtakes there haven't even been you know what he could do he could do a collection of other things he's appeared on. You know, he was on Keith Moon's album. Um, he did that, um, you know, anti-heroin song. He's been in a lot of um, film soundtracks that have not been tracks on his album. We were talking about the one from Curly Sue last week. Um, Scouse the Mouse. Scouse and the Mouse. And Scouse the yeah. Mouse, right. You know, there's a lot of that stuff that could be collected together as a Ringo right. release and hasn't and, been, you know, unless... And there, yeah. there have been bootlegs of this stuff. Right. But I have a feeling that there's going to be some kind of clearance problem with that if you're dealing with a lot of different record labels, you know, and who owns the rights to each recording. That is the thing with Ringo. I mean, he had he was off Capitol for a while, and he... <laughs> 
you know, he went through some different labels. So yeah, yeah. that probably he that probably a, is part he of it. Sang a song in in that Alice in Wonderland TV appearance right. he made as the Mock Turtle. Uh, called nonsense. It was called nonsense. Nonsense, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you know, there's there's actually all kinds of stuff, even among the release things that really need to be sort of roped together um, to show the other side of of what Ringo's been up to. But you know, maybe some outtakes or demos and things. Uh, you know, they they must exist. They whether or not they're interesting, who knows? But um, even even if, even I mean, even putting that aside, just doing a straight compilation would be a good idea for him. I mean, because, like I said, that, that Ringo Greatest Hits thing was really a revelation as far as how good a, a, a um, an output he has had. And it really would boost his, it really would boost his, um, his standing, I think, a lot. I think it would, uh, people would take him, I, I don't want to say a lot more seriously, but I think people would appreciate to know some of the stuff he's done. You know, put a few deep cuts on there. I, I think that would be a great idea. He but has, it's also got to be promoted, too. It can't could, just be released and that's it. I right. hope Alan, that everybody discovers it. Yeah. What were you going to say? Uh, he has he has devoted some effort to his photography. Right. And, and some of the things he's collected over the years, like the postcards, you know, from, mm-hmm. from the guys. I mean, he's he has put those things out. Um, generally speaking, they at least first come out in the really sort of pricey Genesis editions. And then I think they've all come out in, in trade editions, too. Um, but that's something. I mean, that's another side of his of his work um, that, you know, we should consider if we're considering legacy as a whole. Right, right. Um, probably, okay. you know, as, as you say, there'd be rights problems, but probably someone should maybe collect his film appearances in some sort of a, a, a an organized, unified way. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me let me clarify one thing that I just said before, because I was talking about the clearance issues and all. Mm-hmm. I was referring to all these side projects, yeah, not the music that's on Ringo's albums, because photograph the very best of Ringo Starr, really collected everything from the very beginning of his solo career, from, say, you know, not in, well, there's nothing from Sentimental Journey in there, but It Don't Come Easy on, or Buku's of Blues on, mm-hmm. through all the Mark Hudson stuff. Yeah. So, you know, that was all together in one collection. That can be done. Mm-hmm. But if you want to add all this other stuff, like you said, and, and uh, well, Scouse the Mouse, that kind of stuff... You, you know, you have to deal with whatever record labels put that out, and there could be complications there. So you never know. But, um, you know, when it comes to preserving the legacy, I do believe that it's very important in what you're doing live. And I got to give Ringo all the credit in the world for making the All Star Band concept such a big part of his career. And we're actually talking about almost 30 years now of doing this. But all of his tours pretty much highlight his biggest hits in his solo career. Some Beatles songs, maybe one or two new songs, but it doesn't really span you know, his solo catalog. He's not there to give you a history lesson on the solo career of Ringo Starr. So you know, he's not really promoting his solo catalog right. in, in that regard. And um, like I've said before, Ringo, Paul, they have no control over what radio plays, but they do have control over what they do live. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Ringo certainly doesn't go deep into his uh, solo catalog at all. And I don't think he ever really. will. I don't think he had it. I, I really, I mean, if he hasn't done it by now, he's not going to start. So. Mm-hmm. so that's a part of it. If you want the legacy to endure, you got to let the people know about it. You right. got to expose them to it. Right. And, um, you know, I think when Ringo puts on his all-star band shows, he's there for everyone to have a good time. And like I said, not to give everybody a history lesson about his career. And uh, it's all the songs you know and love, as yeah. he always says. Yeah. So okay. he doesn't want to have to teach anybody anything. If anything, it's it's a bit of a miracle that he does his new material when he does. Yeah. So, 
You know, he doesn't seem to like looking back all that much. Um, and and I, should, no. I should credit my wife, Paula, with that observation. We were talking about this, what we were going to talk about on the show this afternoon. And, and I was talking about, you know, how little Ringo's done. And she said, but, you know, he's not that kind of guy. I mean, he wants, he does his new things. He's out there in the present and he's not that interested in looking back at the legacy it's you know, he doesn't even he stuff. doesn't even like to talk about it in interviews yeah, i know mm. yeah and it's kind of strange in a way i mean i don't know what ringo could actually do in terms of either outtakes or background material to show what he really has done. I mean, what his importance was in the Beatles and, and that kind of thing. I mean, in a way, the best thing for Ringo's legacy in recent years has been Mark Lewison's book, Tune In, because that really made it clear that when the Beatles were, when the, uh, the rest of them were just sort of a knock-around band in Liverpool that were barely keeping it together, Ringo was a professional drummer in demand. You know, mm -hmm. and um, and he's he's given, I think, a, a view of Ringo that is so opposite of the conventional, uh, you know, he was just lucky to get in kind of story that um, in, in terms of Ringo's legacy as an artist, I think that's been a really important thing uh, and not something that Ringo himself did or could do, really. Mm hmm. So, yeah. Well, this uh, the thing that you said about staying in the present, if you really were to follow the interviews that all four Beatles have done in their solo careers, uh -huh. it's rare when they give anything comprehensive. It's always about the latest album or the latest project with some Beatle questions in there. Yeah. And that's the way it is. And when the public only is exposed to that, they don't know about everything in between. <laughs> yeah. And the sad thing is that everything, everything in between is the bulk of their work. Right. You well, know, I, think, so. I, th I think for a long time, though, there are, you know, in the uh, 70s and, and 80s, they didn't want to talk about that. They, I think they went through a period, especially in the 70s, after the breakup, where the Beatles were the kind of the last things on their mind. They were No, they I'm, were, I'm talking about discussing the solo works from the beginning on. No, they and that's what really... I'm, that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. That basically in the '70s and 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 the '80s, that's all they would talk about is the solo career, and they didn't really want to talk about the Beatles. Mm. Um, where yeah, but but I think what Ken is saying is that you know when Paul would come out and promote um, uh, like off the ground, it wasn't like he was going to spend half an hour on the details of recording Ram. Right, you know, right. Like, or even talking about Ram for for one minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's also no, a, question, a matter of the questions that they get asked. You know, I mean, I have right. a feeling if someone asked him about Ram, he'd answer the question. You know. Yeah, Probably. that's true. Well, we were hoping to do all four Beatles in one hour, but that's not going to happen because we got <laughs> we started talking and. As usual, once we start talking, we just keep going. So we're going to do George Harrison and Paul McCartney next week, and then we'll do the, the Beatles as a group the week after. So you can get a hold of the show by writing Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. You can download us at Podbean. Uh, you can catch us on iTunes where you don't have to download us. You can just stream us there. Um, we're also on the TuneIn Radio app. We have a, a Facebook page, uh, Be uh, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, where you can uh, uh, come and talk to us and throw throw things at us or, or criticize us. Actually, somebody, I, now, that I, now that I think about it, somebody had a suggestion that said, um, he said, what happened to the behind the scenes in the Beatle world between December 8th, 1980, and the 20th November 1995, the launch of the Anthology Project. So there's a there's something that we could think about anyway. Um, but anyway, uh, you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. Um, and I also have my personal Facebook page where I post Beatles 
and other stuff, not just Beatles. Uh, so if you're looking for straight Beatles, uh, come to Beatles News and Information on Facebook, which is where I post just about Beatles. Um, Ken, let's go to you next. If folks want to reach me, they can do so at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Um, also, there's my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Every single week, you can enter in my Beatles trivia contest and win one of nine incredible prizes, including the brand new Ringo Starr album, uh, Give More Love. And uh, you can win the CD or the album. I do have the vinyl to give away as well. I don't think we ever mentioned this on the show, but the CD has the four bonus tracks. The vinyl does not. Right. I don't know if people know that or not. But, uh, yeah, you can win the CD or the vinyl. And I'm also giving you the chance to win a double shot of Kiddo Toolbooks, songs who are singing, guided tours behind the Beatles' lesser-known works, and Michael Jackson FAQ. So you can win two books in one shot right there, as well as so many other great prizes. Plus, I have the new interview with Bruce Sugar, who was the engineer on Ringo's new album and has actually worked with him since the Ringo Rama album. And that's all at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right, Ken, uh, Alan, your turn. Um, the easiest way to get in touch with me is either through the group email, which Steve gave, I think, or Alan Cozen on Facebook or Alan Cozen Remixed. That was too short. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, okay, we will uh, look for us uh, same time or say, roughly same channel, whatever, wherever you find us around the end of the week. And we will look for you uh, on our uh, at listening to our next show. So for Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, saying thank you for listening, and we hope you'll all be here next time. Mm-hmm.